Fierce electric dances doing the glen They join the deviant waters Their dwells all hikes Honest men And hikes bright eyed daughters And will we loo the gay daltun Elk no prey and tender She I has kept the cause grun and ever independent. What though at last our wild are we, and they'll take keep in order. My neither turn she bears the green, the queen of all the border. Good forest trees let Galevrag, we care not what be along them. A Hennetyrian flag, there's no more among them. A Hennetyrian past your pits, they've neither grants nor charters. A sore plum tree, a fox that sits upon it in dark waters. What the lads are wild are we, and they'll take keep it on. Very warm welcome uh, from myself as chairman and the fellow members of council to the Sir Walter Scott Club of Edinburgh and especially to our guests. Those of you who have come from a distance, welcome to Edinburgh. Those of you who live here, welcome to our new club and to its splendid long, long room from which you will see your guests, the castle, hanging in the sky. As you all know, it is our long tradition that the incumbent must be a man or woman who has rendered significant service to the political, industrial, or literary life of the nation, while also having a major connection either with the legacy of Scott or with the Borders. And these criteria are amply filled tonight. It being also our tradition not, Mr. President, to put undue pressure on you, I will therefore remind you simply as a politician that you are following only three former Prime Ministers uh, to this podium, in Stanley Baldwin, Harold Macmillan, and in your fellow borderer, Sir Alec Douglas Hill. Lord Samuelson of Bowden was born within the mile of Abbotsford, and was educated at St. Mary's School, Melrose, and at Glenarmon, where he was chairman of the council. I hasten to add that it was only after he left school that he became chairman of the council, but uh, looking at his CV, what one wonders what took him so long. He was commissioned into the Royal Signals and served with 31st Highland Div Signals and then as a TA officer uh, with the KOSBs. A long and distinguished career followed in business, particularly the textile industry in the borders, and for example, he is still presently chairman of the Hoyt Kashmir Company. But also, the interests and directorships followed in the investment trust sector and in banking. And indeed, he was chairman of the Clydesdale Bank from 1994, 19, uh, 99, sorry, to 2004. His interests also in higher education are attested by the honorary degrees which he holds from both Napier University and the University uh, of Glasgow. On the political front, uh, from 1987 to 1990, Lord Sanderson was Minister of State at the Scottish Office, responsible for housing, agriculture, and fisheries. And thereafter, he served as chairman of the Conservative Party in Scotland from 1990 to 93, last year being asked to chair a review into the governance and future structure of the party in Scotland. And finally, most importantly for us in this club, he is the chairman of the Abbotsford Trust, whose patron is our last but one president in Richard, the Duke of McClure in Queensbury. The trust, as we very much appreciate, sir, has been proceeding with considerable success with the fundraising necessary to conserve and thus preserve this great house and its contents, and above all, to advance the wider knowledge of Scott and his literary legacy, both at home and abroad. Russell Sanderson was knighted in 1981 and raised to the peerage four years later as Baron Sanderson of Bowden of Melrose in the district of Ettrick and Lauderdale. And as chairman of this club, it now gives me great pleasure to invite Lord Sanderson to deliver the presidential toast to the memory of Sir Walter Scott. Lord Sanderson. My Lord Provost, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm truly honoured to have been asked to be your president this year. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I ever should be doing such a thing at a Sir Walter Scott, Scott Club dinner, reminding me of the story of the lady who went to America with her husband, and her husband was delivering a big uh, speech to a very large audience, and a friend of hers came up to her and said, I don't suppose in your wildest dreams you ever thought your husband will be addressing such an august gathering to which she said, my husband doesn't figure in my wildest dreams. Firstly, <laughs> 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 um, I, uh, I bring you greetings uh, from all the Abbotsford trustees and all who are working to secure the future of Sir Walter's legacy. When I was asked to join Andrew Douglas Hume and Tony Taylor, as the, we were called then, the Three Musketeers, I realised that we had a big task ahead of us. But having been born in Darnick and now living in nearby Bowden, I thought the Duke of Darnick, for that was one of Sir Walter's local names, would have approved. As a boy, the Rhymers Glen, called Shields Lock, the Elwyn Glen, Chiefswood, was where I spent much of my early days, and at St Mary's School in Melrose I learnt something about Sir Walter and the Lady of the Lake. Not a lot, I have to say. Mm -hmm. I found it quite difficult at that age. Mm -hmm. and near at hand was where we called the Gazika Woods. Now, you wonder what Gazikas were. Well, they were up the hill near the Eildens, very near the mental hospital. But we didn't call it the Mental Hospital, I'm not going to tell you what we did call it. But there were strange people roaming about in the woods out there. At least in our imagination they were. But I don't wish to talk tonight about the plans for Abbotsford. Suffice to say that 2011, that's this year, will see the start of an enormous project which should set the scene for many years to come. And I'd like to thank you all here, those of you who have helped already uh, uh, lend a hand in the work that we're doing. I know there will be varying views on aspects of what we have planned, but be assured that we have to take action swiftly to adapt and to survive. I have chosen two areas to talk to you, ladies and gentlemen, about tonight on the vast canvas that covers Sir Walter's life and work. Not surprisingly, you may say, I'll say something about Sir Walter and politics. But firstly, you should know that I and my family are now and have been since about 1860 involved with the border textile industry. My grandfather, Andrew Pubber Sanson, came from Dalkey to Selkirk as an apprentice in a mill there and became a mill owner in Gal Shields. The firm was Simon Simonson in Botany Mill. And I was looking through the history of Gala the other day and found at that time there were about 22 mills in that little town. The mill prospered from 1870 to 1926 when it collapsed in the Big Depression, leaving my father and his brothers with the failure and the severe consequences which failure in those days brought with it. I can therefore appreciate the effect the collapse of the Ballantyne printing and publishing firm had on Sir Walter exactly a hundred years earlier. As reported in John Button's biography of Scott, this is what Scott said, his first thoughts were for those who had made their home under his shadow. He said, this news will make sad hearts at Darnick and in the cottages at Abbotsford. But when the going gets tough, the tough get going. To this day, I've no idea whether I'm an only child because the mill's failure took place, but I do know that my father got going and built a yarn and wool merchanting business from nothing, and I was able to carry it on, having given up my place at Cambridge to read cat classics and came back to Gala and Bradford to learn the trade. That business took me to Hoyt and to Lanham, selling yarn, wool and thread to the many mills that existed in those towns. Hoyt mainly knitting, Langham mainly weaving. So it is Hoyt that I wish to talk about, and the land to the south and west of Hoyt, with its common ridings, Callant's Club, Teviotdale Farmers Club, the Moss Paul Ride, 
the nearest town to Branksome Castle, the home of the Buclues in the old days, and the nearest town to the wild country that features in Guy Mannering. Guy Mannering, as you know, Solway Firth, but also that wild country to the south and west of Hoyk. Listen to what Sir Walter said in a note in that novel. The roads of Liddesdale in Dandy Dimmond's days could not be said to exist, and the district was only accessible through a succession of tremendous morasses. About 30 years ago, the author says, at about 1790, he himself was the first person who ever drove a little open carriage into these wilds, the excellent roads by which they are now traversed being then in some progress. The people stared with no small wonder at the sight, which many of them had never witnessed in their lives before. Not so many years ago, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a wild country still. As John Buchan recounts in his biography of Scott, in 1792, along with Robert Shortreed, the sheriff's substitute of Roxburghshire, he visited Lizisdale for the first time, and thereafter for seven years the raid was repeated. On the first journey, the only expense the travellers incurred was the feed of corn for their horses at Rickerton Mill. They slept in cot houses or farms or manses as their road led them and enjoyed Homeric hospitality. He was collecting horns and steel bonnets, many still at Abbotsford, and more important, the songs and tunes of a vanishing world. Please note, ladies and gentlemen, the songs and tunes for the borders are well known for its songs, whether it be at common ridings, and we'll talk about that later, or in the operatic societies in all the towns today. Unfold the Tyriadon flag to kiss the breeze of oh, summer and blessed again the inspiring strain. Led on by what a drama, the halberdiers wear buttons clear like sunbeams brightly glancing. The cornet and his merry, merry men on meadows deeds are prancing. What though our lads are wild are we, and they'll take keep in order. Long hither the tune she bears the green, that we know on a border. Then let the prolot come the morn, and Delokian bring his deary. He'll wish that he had never been born, or else been born a deary. Then up we hoik three times three, the loan that win a chorus, be hung upon a sore blow. 